Welcome everyone. We're going to have a fun video for you today. We're taking a little bit of detour. Business to sports. Still related to business, but diving into sports, looking at some of the key topics. First one, Kevin, capology. We're, we're NHL season done. We're dealing with all the trades, all the back and forth. We got to talk about what does that mean? Go through the business terms, starting off with uh, what is a salary cap? Let's start there and then we'll dive in. Yeah, basically, as the definition says, right from Wikipedia, salary caps an agreement or a rule that places a limit on the amount that a team can spend on a player's salary. Now, mm -hmm. in North America, out of the big four sports, three of them do have a salary cap, and we're going to deal with the NHL in specific because it's easiest to deal detail with one as opposed to all the nuances and everybody else. But that's where yeah. it is. So the NHL salary cap is what's known as a hard cap, and there are no exemptions to that. So the hard cap means that you have to be underneath whatever that cap number is with your players to be able to play. You cannot exceed it at all. And again, the amount of salary is set each year depending on how the league's revenues do because the mm. revenues are tied to the cap as to how much you can spend on a player's salary. That's an important thing to know. And that's sort of the basics on what an NHL salary cap is. Yeah, and we got to get to how do we get to a salary cap because NHL was the first of the major leagues to have yes. a hard cap and it wasn't always that way, right? So we have to rewind, rewind back to kind of the 90s, the 2000s. You can see this little blurb here that's from NHL.com that shows the winners, Kevin, of the, the cup winners going through that late 90s, early 2000s period. I highlighted the Red Wings. I probably could have picked any of the other teams, but I picked the Wings because I don't like them. I was always cheering for Patrick Waugh, which meant <laughs> I was a fan of the Habs or the Avalanche. But the idea was that in the 90s into early 2000s, you had an era there in the NHL where – there were some teams that had a little more money and they were able to keep getting the top players and they were kind of being a very top heavy league, right? And the Red Wings were one of those teams that were accused of doing exactly that, signing the top guys because they had the money to do that. And then it ended up with a lockout year because the owners were pushing back. They wanted a little more quality and you actually had a year where there was no hockey at all and eventually ended up with that salary cap the following year. Now pull this up. You can see that uh, or. 04, 05 year, there was no hockey. That was the lockout. Nope. The cap came into place in 05. And you can see the details there. It's based on league revenue every year. The cap tends to increase as the league does generate a little more revenue. A couple of exceptions there. You had the 2012, 2013, which was a partial year. Yep. There was another negotiation there. They still played hockey, but not a full year. So they had 60 million as the cap. And then the COVID years, things flatlined for a while before starting to go back up in the 2022 season. Anything you want to add to the, the salary cap history here? Yeah, no, I mean, basically you're right in that aspect. And, and the reason that they had to have that lockout in the first place is because you had, you know, smaller market Canadian teams as well as smaller mm -hmm. market U.S. teams. And they were worried it was going to go to the baseball scenario where the top teams spend all the money, the bottom the teams Yankees. don't, and just basically become a feeder system for the top teams. So having that salary cap, you get a more competitive balance. That's the main thing. And, and the cap, as we say, also has a minimum and a maximum amount that can be spent. That's a big thing to know. So they have to make sure teams are competitive. So you have to spend at least a certain amount on the bottom end, but you can only spend a certain amount on the high end. And you're right. I mean, due to lockouts and COVID and things like that, with salaries being tied to league revenue, that's a huge factor that goes on as to how this cap's going to work going forward. And so far, it's been fairly successful. We have seen a lot more competition, especially from teams on the lower mm -hmm. end of the market scale that are competing with the big boys. The expansion teams. I mean, just look at the last couple of years, yep. right? New teams coming to the league and being incredibly competitive. The cap, one reason, there's other reasons why, but it would be part of the reason. Mm -hmm. We'll dive in a little deeper here before we do. A quick reminder, if you have questions, whether it's on hockey, business <laughs> of sports, or on personal <laughs> finance, we're certainly love to hear from you on all those topics. You can visit the website, chat with Clinton, clintonandkevin.com, fill in the form, comes directly to us. We'll certainly address all those questions. So we talked about the, the salary cap, uh, kind of yep. high-level definition, the history, why it came into play, some of the numbers. We now need to get into the details. How do they calculate this thing, Kevin? How do they actually determine whether a team is above or below their cap? Well, basically, each player has what's known as an ad, annual average value or an mm. AAV for short is the easiest way to put it. And your AAV is basically decided by taking what your total salary is plus your signing bonus and dividing that by the number of years of your contract. So again, you'll see these deals for 60 million or 65 million, but you know, if it's over seven or eight years, it's a lower cap hit. And that's a big factor. So you only have a certain amount of money. So you only want to pay each player certain amounts. Now your top players are going to get a large amount of money, which yeah. means you're going to have to fix in that cap somewhere. There's going to be guys that are getting lower money than maybe what they feel they should, or you're going to bring guys up that are on what are known as entry-level contracts. And that's mm -hmm. another thing that's completely off the chart. But yeah, so your AAV 
basically decides. And you add that up over the number of players you have on your team to get whether or where you are in that salary cap. That's a yeah, big and factor. you add it up for the whole team, right? So if yep. you have one player that's uh, you know a ten million AAV and another at two, and you add them all up, that's how you get to the total salary cap. I pulled this up mm -hmm. here. This is Puckpedia.com, and this is looking currently at the different divisions. You can see the projected cap hit, the projected space, and you can see where the teams currently fall within that. And I highlighted Toronto here, Kevin, because you might notice <laughs> they're well above the limit. You can see a big negative here, that eleven million dollar negative, meaning they're actually over. By 11 million. You want to tell us what's going on here? Yeah, everybody wants to know, well, if it's a hard cap and you can't exceed it, how can the Maple Leafs be over? Well, during the offseason, you are allowed to be over that cap as long as on day one of the season you are cap compliant at that 83.5 yeah. million. So they've obviously signed some players right now. They're going to have to make some adjustments. And there's also something known as long term injury reserve or LTIR, which we'll describe in later videos, that will have a play as to how that cap works. But yeah, and the other factor to notice is that. You are only allowed a maximum of 23 players on your roster. That is a big one. So within that 23 players, now you don't have to have 23. You could have 21 mm -hmm. or 18 or whatever to get in that cap. But 23 is the max you can have. And 20 players is all you can dress for any game. And you must be cap compliant with the 23 players, though, on your salary scenario. So if a team just wants to run 20 and have no spares left around, they can do that and be cap compliant. But these are the things that you have to know. So yeah. getting under that cap is something that you want to do or being at that cap level. Yeah, and I pulled up an example here. This is uh, from Cap Friendly. You can see it at the very top here. This is the Winnipeg Jets. And I'll go through a specific example player by player as I scroll down here. And you can see you got Kyle uh -huh. Connor. You can see his cap hit. They have it over the years, how it might change, like 2023, 2024 season. Also, you'll notice this right here, Kevin, the percentage of the cap and my understanding is no player can be more than 20 percent of a team's cap so they can't just spend no. all the money in one player and then give little amounts to everyone else there's still a cap in terms of how much any one player on the team can make and for the jets the highest in terms of percentage you can see the 8.6 i highlighted here was for kyle connor shifley yep. there at 7.3 i go down the list you got uh, on the defense here, you got Morrissey at 7.5% of the overall cap and Halibut at 74 And you can see, we'll get into this perhaps in another video, but injured reserve, Cole Perfetti on the injured reserve list. You got Blake Wheeler here on the buyout, all other aspects that get into capology. And then you want to add, as we scroll through the players here, and you see the different cap hits and their percentages. Yeah, and I mean, basically... The, the, the theory is, is that if you spend less percentage on one player, you have much more money to spend on other players to round your team out. Where as mm -hmm. if you go to that 20 percent on one player, well, now you've got 80 percent to spend on the other 22 players and that may not fit the team going forward. So you've got to worry about that scenario. And as of right now, no player has 20 percent for one team, though a lot of people think that Austin Matthews next contract may be 20 percent of the Toronto Maple Leafs as a whole. So we'll have to wait and see. I mean, the Connor McDavid's of the world, the Nathan McKinnon's all get those sort of salaries. But the, the more that you equalize things out, the chances are you'll have more players that higher salaries that are better players that you can put on your team. And that will help out your your salary cap going forward. Yeah, and we're going to do a couple of videos here, the business of sports. This would be the first in that overall series, so look for the other videos. Those will be coming out soon, and we'll be back again with those. So take care, everyone. We'll be back soon.